Good evening, um, everyone. I am Charlotte Vignon, Curator of Decorative Arts here at the Frick Collection. And I am delighted to welcome you all here and to introduce our guest speaker, Camille Le Prince, for tonight's lecture, Baroque Faience at, uh, in André Le Nôte's Gardens. Camille is a renowned art dealer, historian, and expert on European faience, Mayolica, and self porcelain. He holds graduate degrees from the Ecole du Louvre and Sorbonne University, where he is also a PhD candidate. He has published and authored a number of books on European ceramics, including more, most recently La Faience Baroque Francaise et les Jardins de Le Nôtre in 2014, the subjects of tonight's lecture, but also Napoleon and Sèvres, L'Art de la Porcelaine au Service de l'Empire in 2016, and Sacred and Profane Beauty, uh, Deruta Renaissance Mayolica uh, last year, uh, no, in 2017, sorry, we're in 19, for which he co curated an exhibition uh, of the same name at the Region Museum of, um, of Ceramic in Deruta in Italy. From a very early um, stage, Kemi worked with some of the best dealers in Paris and he is now um, really have gained the, um, the status of being himself a, a great authority uh, in the field and uh, is also a um, friend now with some of, and um, as the clients of some, some of the most uh, important collectors of, of faience, uh, porcelain, and, and, and Mayolica. And you also have built a very close relationship with our trustees, uh, Sidney Knafon, whom he helped build um, what has become now one of the best collection of French faience uh, in the world. And 75 of these um, fabulous pieces are now on display in the Portico Gallery uh, at the Frick until September 22. And I remind you that that exhibition or this uh, lecture is actually in conjunction with that uh, exhibition and you will be able to see it for half an hour after uh, the lecture. Kami has also become a personal friend of mine and I would like to take this opportunity to thank him uh, for his invaluable help in preparing the exhibition without which it will simply not have been uh, possible. Please uh, be advised that this lecture is uh, live streamed and uh, archived on our website, so you can see it many times uh, if you wish. And I will also ask you to turn off or put your uh, sinful on uh, silence um, now, if you, if you can. And uh, now it's time to welcome Camille Le Prince. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. First, I would like to thank the Freak for inviting me tonight. I would like to thank Sidney Knafel for his invaluable friendship. And I would like to congratulate Charlotte, who did an amazing job with this exhibition. I strongly recommend you to visit the exhibition because it's a unique event for the world of French faience, especially in North America. Today, we will be speaking about French Baroque faience and the gardens of André Le Nôtre, two very distinct fields. My story starts in the Loire Valley, where I grew up. As a child, I was very familiar with the royal gardens. It was my backyard, so to speak. So, one of my favorite castles in the Loire Valley is the Château de Chenonceau. This is in Chenonceau, where we have among the first Renaissance Royal Gardens. He goes back to the year 5055 with King Henry II. The king gave the, the Chateau de Chenonceau not to his wife, Catherine de Medici, but to his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. He absolutely adored Diane. She was 20 years older than the king, but he was madly in love with her. So by giving the chateau, he was making a statement of his love. When she received the castle, once there, she made another statement of her own. She built a garden. This is what you see here, the large rectangular garden. It was a major work at the time. It took about four years to complete the garden. 
the king had to raise a special tax to pay for this garden. Diane wanted to make a statement of her power over the land and over the court. I want to look at the garden closely. You see here an upper terrace. It was an enclosed space. Diana would have enjoyed the garden by walking from this terrace and she, was, she would be above the garden. The garden was meant to be enjoyed at every season. It was not only productive, it was also a decorative garden. You will, she would admire flowers, fruits, and vegetables. The garden was not for public access. It was meant for the private use of Diane and her friends and her lady in waiting. They would be walking around the garden wearing beautiful dresses, and they would view the garden, but they would be viewed from the castle. So it was really a statement for Diane, a status symbol. But five years after she completed the garden, the king died, and Catherine de' Medici kicked Diana out of the castle. And the first thing Catherine did, she built a garden of her own, the little one you see here across the drawbridge. In many ways, it is strikingly similar. When Renaissance time, the garden was meant for private use, it was a safe, enclosed space. It was a little paradise. We know from archives this is where Catherine will walk, and this is where she will be with a lady in waiting, but also with an advisor. This is where she will take political decision. This is where she will discuss secret matters. Within 100 years, rich and famous of France, rich and, and powerful of France, will outdo each other, creating gardens always more and more extravagant. One man embody the fashion for the Jardin à la Française, French garden, is André Le Nôtre, where at that time is not about a safe, enclosed space anymore. It's a great place of entertainment. So landscape are being reshaped. Huge canals and rivers are being rechanneled to supply extravagant water fountain. These are works who will imply and the work of thousands of men. The first garden created by André Le Nôtre is very famous because it was the one created for Ch Le Chateau de Volvicomte and the French finance minister, Nicolas Fouquet. It is in this very garden that Fouquet, through an important party on the 17th of August, 1661, it was, in, it was a sumptuous party thrown in honor of the king. Everybody was amazed by the wealth and the sumptuous um, decor in the garden, in the castle, and in the garden as well. Well, the king wasn't pleased at all. And two weeks later, Fouquet was sent to jail. King Louis XIV took Le Vaux, the architect, Le Brun, the designer, and Le Nôtre, the gardener, for, for Versailles. So today, we will be speaking about these two types of wear the garden urns, but also sumptuous wear. This is what you see here. The garden urns on this side and the sumptuous wear produced for banquet that was made for special parties in the garden. As I said, at that time, in the Baroque time, the gardens were a place where you would have great festivities and great banquet. So my, because the art of garden and the art of ceramic are such two distinct fields, it was um, very new to bring them together. So you will see my, my investigation has been quite a fascinating puzzle. We had to use archives, the deliveries, graphic sources, engraving, painting, also contemporary, the other field of decorative arts like tapestries, or um, furniture, and also archaeology. So you will see it's going to be great fun to go together through this garden and trying to put ceramic uh, together in there. But first of all, I want to talk about the situation of the industry of ceramic in France in the 17th century. During the second half of the 17th century, no faience factory was directly protecting and supported by the King Louis XIV. The main factories were located in Nevers, and Burgundy, right here, and Rouen. 
so quite far away from Paris and Versailles. The industry of faience came from Italy. He came with colonies of Ligurian porters. They came from Albisola. They were following the path of glassmaker from Altare. They first settled in Lyon, and then they moved to Nevers at the end of the 16th century, where they found the protection of an Italian duke, Louis Gonzaga, who was Duke of Mantua and Duke de Nevers. And two generations later, these are the same porter who, we, who will supply for all the French court. So if one building embodied the French fashion for ceramic, for porcelain, in the 17th century, it is Le Trianon de Porcelain. Well, in fact, it should be named the Trianon de Faience because the building was entirely made of faience. It is necessary to remember that before the 1680s, ceramic technology in Europe hadn't developed beyond the production of faience and other earthenwares, except for the Fontana workshop at the Medici court in Florence in the 1580s. No European factory was producing porcelain, neither soft paste porcelain or no hard paste porcelain before the very end of the 17th century. In France, we were producing soft paste porcelain in the town of Rouen in Saint-Cloud, but in an experimental scale. So none of the factory could supply such a place like the Trianon de Porcelain. So the Trianon de Porcelain was designed by the architect Levo. It's, on a, it's of a classical architecture, in which the fashion for China, à la manière de la Chine, in the Chinese manner, was really meant for the blue and white. So we, we know only engraving from the Trianon de Porcelain, but I suggested this non-scientific reconstitution by Zega, because I think it gives a very good idea of what it could have looked like. So it was an extravagant place, full of vases made of faience, or painted metal. And the Trianon de Porcelain was located far away from the chateau, all the way back here in the gardens of Trianon. The building was created for the love and delight of Louis XIV and his mistress, Madame de Montespan. Madame de Montespan at that time was very powerful and she was surnamed the Sultan Queen, La Reine Sultan. Inside the Trianon de Porcelain, we know that there were thousands of Dutch Delft tiles. Delft was the other prominent center of the production of faience. There were many factories in Delft, and Delft was extremely important. The Delft faience was imported in France through the Marchand Mercier Claude Révérend. But the French finance minister Colbert, Colbert was not very keen into the importation of um, production made out of the country. So in France, la manière de la Chine was really this idea of having a blue and white furniture or anything, fabric, stucco. Here you see a beautiful writing table that is now in the Getty Museum made by Pierre Goll, and you see it's made of ivory and blue tinted horn. It's an exquisite table. So this is most like, these tables were most likely a part of the furnishing of the Trianon de Porcelain. And here, this is the first faience we see. That is made of Nevers. It's all, more than a meter high, so it's quite an achievement for the, the pottery. You see the clay. So what is earthenware? It's a clay on which you will put a tin glaze, a glaze made of tin, so it will become white. And we will see later that the Nevers porter mastered in that technique with the blue. So here, what is interesting to see is they were making furniture, furniture, furniture and ceramic. So we can imagine this beautiful pavilion made of faience furniture in blue and white. So I started to look into the gardens of Trianon. And we, the archaeologists of Versailles, has published a lot of material. Here we find fragment. I'm showing you fragment that was dug up from the gardens of Trianon. The garden of Trianon were one of the first gardens made by Le Nôtre in Versailles, and they were filled with flowers. So we knew that 
they had the need for having finance urn. The first delivery in Versailles is in the 4th of December, 1665, by Nicolas Etienne, who was a porter, the owner of the factory, the Echeomo in Nevers. In Nevers, just like in Delft, there were many factories, about a dozen, who were being productive at that time. So, as a ceramic specialist, my job had to identify each fragment and to understand from which the complete object they came from, and then to try to locate the production and to date it. So, and that works exactly as we, we, we found from the archives we, that finals were being delivered from Delft, from Nevers, and from Rouen, or Saint Cloud. So here we found many pieces of Nevers and Delft, always in blue and white in the manière de la Chine, like Chinese porcelain. So the deliveries at the beginning were made, the, the first delivery was made by a Nevers porter. It was a small delivery, and most likely it was a sample. He came to deliver what he was making. And then all the deliveries were made by a, what we call a marchand faïencier. He is a go-between between the porter and the court. And that marchand faïencier is Pierre Le Maire. And from the archives, we found hundreds and thousands of deliveries of ceramic for all the gardens created by Le Nôtre. Recently, we found this vase that I call the Garcia vase because it's after the name of his current owner, Jacques Garcia, the international home de uh, interior designer, very famous, and he's very fond of Versailles. That is a monumental urn painted in blue and white with Chinese figure according to the latest fashion, and is a baroque shape, very structured, with baroque handles with strange looking mask on each side. What is key with this piece is the French royal coat of arm. So this is the type of vase that we could have found in the Trianon, in the gardens of Trianon or in the Trianon de Porcelain. So now what we found in the archives was the delivery of vase jasmin, jasmine vase. So the most common type of vase. It's of a baluster shape with twisted handle. And on the bottom, you always have three holes. So here you clearly see the function of the vase. It was meant to be move around, so strong handles, and it was meant to pot a plant or a tree which you will water. So they clearly had a function. They came in different sizes. So this one is about uh, six inches high, that one about, um, I will say 15, and this one about 25. So they can become quite large. And the production is very wide and varied, uh, on, um, in the variety. So you see different with the blue Persian ground, which I will discuss later, the blue and white according to the Chinese manner, and also some decor uh, more colorful. And you see they can come with the twisted end all, or the Apollo head. So they come in different sizes, different shapes, is a very eclectic production. These are the most common pot and most likely meant to receive flowers, such as um, jasmine or laurels from Alexandria. And here you have the, more, the bigger urns. Some are monumental, but as I say, a meter high. But you see, once again, that the production can be quite eclectic for the pattern and the shape. One of the most exceptional is just across the room in the exhibition. This is a beautiful urn, monumental, it's about a meter high, of a very structured octagonal shape with the Apollo head. So it's typical of the Baroque time. What I want to draw your attention is for the pattern, which is extremely modern. Here, the Neve Porters were looking toward Asia, Chinese or Japanese porcelain. Why? For this schematic way to paint a landscape and to put colors together. There is no aim of realism. We're not, going, we're not looking toward Italy or the Western Occidental uh, tradition. No aim of pers perspective, neither realism. What is interesting here is to see the porters, the way they're just using what we call a decor a la palette, meaning the simple color, the, 
simple range of color of enamel of the Grand Feu. The blue de cobalt, chromium green, orange from ochre, and antimony from yellow, and some of the manganese. In some way, I like to compare with the Fauvist painter in Paris in 1900, because these painters were taking their influence from Japanese watercolor as well. So that shows us how creative and modernist were these porters at that time. And here is Matisse, and we know that Matisse was a collector of Nevers Faience. You see here a pot right behind him. I'm not saying that he took his inspiration from the Faience, but it's interesting to see how the interpretation from the influence of Asia came and with the same, a similar result. So one of the famous patterns created in Nevers is what we call le, le décor bleu persan, Persian blue. He came from Middle Eastern Safavid ceramic made in the 16th century. It was a clear reference to lapis lazuli. Here we were trying to make out of clay, so rather modest material, a precious object, or looking like a precious stone. This is what you see here. The Neve Porter, this, and I'm sorry, it was also very costly. It was much more costly to produce such an item um, than the regular tin glaze earthenware ceramic. To use, they had to use a large quantity of cobalt, which was quite expensive at the time. So it was, it, it was a costly object. And you see here, the Neve Porter interpreted all the different pattern from Asian porcelain or from Iznik ceramic. So Iznik ceramic was made in Turkey in the 16th century. So you see here with the, uh, the, the birds and the different floral pattern. And I will show you more. And one of the most creative pattern is what we call a decor à la bougie. It's a sort of drop of candle wax, a white dot on this blue ground. So we know the glassmaker from Altare. I told you that all porters were following the path of the glassmaker, were producing the some sort of similar object at that time. So it's interesting to see the interaction between glass and ceramic. It was a very modern and strange looking exotic pattern. It was also easier to, quicker to produce, so easier to supply a large commission. So a lot of these garden urns were made or painted with this pattern. Here, talking about the Bleu de Persan, I'm showing you one of the finest pieces we know today from that production. It is from Sidney Knafel collection and is shown across the courtyard. I strongly invite you to have a look because it's, it's a unique opportunity. It's a large oval platter with a very rich pattern influenced by Turkish ceramic from Iznik, where you see bouquet of um, carnations, roses, tulips, all the flowers that were fashionable at that time, that they were collecting, and always you will find the bird. What I really like is this rich pattern with ochre and yellow. You see they're trying to enhance the blue lapis ground with gold. And that was quite an achievement, technically, to, to make this happen. With the firing, it was also a, a real challenge. Two other amazing pieces from Le Décor Bleu Persan are this ewer and this basin. What we call the decor bleu persan was first named by Alexandre Brognard. Alexandre Brognard was the famous director of the Sèvres factory, and his, in his Treaty of Ceramic in 1844, he named this specific pattern. We know he was studying this pattern from a similar ewer that is now in the Sèvres Museum. We know probably a handful of similar models in the world. What is interesting is it took 20 years to Monsieur Knafel to put this together because he bought first the ewer and found later the, the basin. Here, they are a wonderful testimony of the French Baroque. The ewer, you see this snake-shaped handle and the dolphin head here, and this heavy ornament here. So it's very molded and it's also very rich. It's monumental, it's about a meter high. You see a similar shape painted, depicted in this tapestry. So it was very close to what the silverware ordered by the king, le mobilier d'argent. Um, that's what he would have liked, most likely, at that time. What is very modern with this pattern is the bleu 
and the Turkish figure here. In fact, these two pieces match completely the universe, the harmony, the, the universe, but the iconography of the Trianon de Porcelain. Here I'm showing you a drawing of the stucco panel for the entire design of the Trianon de Porcelain. And you see the same as a mix of figure from shepherds and shepherdess and oriental figure. Well, at the time, it was very fashionable to read la littérature précieuse, precious literature. And this literature was based, based on two novels uh, relating stories, love stories, between shepherd and shepherdess in an idealistic world and where they were dressed in costume, oriental costume. So not only the shape, the pattern, but also the iconography match completely the sort of object that will have furnished the Trianon de Porcelain. So I like to imagine that these two pieces will have been a part of a more complete credenza, a buffet, thrown in the gardens of Trianon. So the, the dish is here, and the Yuan Basin are here. So we saw now that the Neve Porters were supplying with very innovative, were producing very innovative, very extravagant objects. They were up to date. So now we're going to look at the different um, representation, depiction of this pot, this ceramic urn um, or ware at that time. So here I'm showing you in, um, tapestries designed by Lebrun himself, where we find a blue and white vase painted according to the Chinese or Turkish manner, because for the French at that time, the chinoiserie and turquerie was the same world, the same dream world of exotic world. What I'd like to draw your attention is to this detail of this tapestry from Les Enfants Jardiniers. Here you see the child being very careful, holding this blue and white pot with twisted and all, just what we're looking at, with this exotic tree. And he's being very careful because it's a very precious tree in a precious pot. And they're putting it in a very precious place made of glass. And glass was also a field of experimentation at that time. So I like to see this idea. Here is really an, an image of modernity in different fields at that time. So they were highly praised. It was also fashionable for one to be portrayed, to have his portrait near flower, with a bouquet of flowers, or near a vase where they had parted a flower. And here you see a vase with twisted and all, blue and white pattern, very similar to a vase such vase. Here are, paint, are depicted Mademoiselle de Blois and the Count, Count of Vermandois, who were the children of King Louis XIV and Mademoiselle de la Vallière. So important children at the French court. So obviously, these faience pots were a symbol of luxury, of modernity of their time. In the second half of the century, the need of this portable container was growing and growing because it was the fashion for flowers and plants and trees. We were trying to acclimate all of these new specimens to the northern climate. So many orangeries were being built in every royal castle. And this is what an orangerie would have looked like during the summer season, where all the exotic trees would be out. So this is the orangerie de Versailles. And during the winter season, you will need to bring them in. And that's where the faience pot were quite convenient. So we, I started to look at all the graphic sources we could find about the different orangerie. And this one is, extremely, is an extremely important document for its precision. Here we have the Chateau de Fontainebleau. It's an engraving made in 1679. So exactly at the time we are looking at, at the time of the Triangle de Porcelain. I want to draw your attention about the profusion, large quantities of trees being displayed all around the orangerie. It's a sort of a frame of the flower bed. You see the entrela. Nowadays, we know all of this design characteristic of the Jardin La Française, but we forgot that they were always systematically framed with this portable container. You had two types of container. The wooden container of a rectangular shape, that you see here, and the ceramic pot. And the ceramic vase will have been displayed 
on the red marble circle. So they were highly viewed, very well displayed, and the idea was to play with the colors. You see the greenery, the blue pot, the red marble. So it would have been a place full of colors everywhere. They were also playing, as you can see here, with the eyes, with the shape, with the eyes. So you also had this idea of a geomet geometrical matrix. This one is a reconstitution we, we just did for fun. Um, it's in the Tuileries Garden, which was another garden designed by Le Nôtre. And so we just did it with my friend Pierre Bonnard, who is the director of the Jardin des Tuileries. So this is how a pot would have been displayed at the time. So here we are in, a other, in the L'Orangerie du, ja, du Château de Saint-Cloud. It's an important castle because it was the residence of Monsieur, the Duc d'Orléans, the Prince d'Orléans. He was the brother of the king, and he was the keenest one of the family for Chinese porcelain. So I really wanted to see how he will appreciate faience vases in his garden. We have the same idea here. That's the orangerie facing the main wing of the castle. And what do we see? We find the same idea of this geometrical matrix and a large profusion of vases. What is very neat is to imagine that the interior of the castle here will have been designed that in this way. Here it's an engraving by Daniel Marot. My, Daniel Marot was a French Huguenot who had to flee France, and he's very known, very well known for having diffused uh, Louis XIV style all over Europe. And what is interesting to look at here is the display of Chinese porcelain. Chinese porcelain was uh, very collectible at the time, and even if in France it was, the importation of Chinese porcelain was not as important as it was in the Netherlands. What is interesting is to see the way they were displayed. They were not, a cup and saucer was not displayed in a glass cabinet. It was displayed on the wall, and we were using the geometric shape. A saucer would have been used for this round shape, and the cup for its conical shape to create a similar geometrical matrix on the wall, just like what you see in the garden. So the way the faience urn were being displayed were very well thought out, just like the porcelain inside. Here it was um, a photo we took in the Jardin du Champ de Bataille. Uh, Jacques Garcia did this uh, incredible work that took him many years and many millions to recreate the Jardin à la Française, and it was very neat to be able to put this pot on site to understand why this blue ground, you know. So where were these vases in Versailles? So as soon as you left La Galerie des Glaces, you will find ceramic pot everywhere. This engraving of the bassin, at the time in the 17th century, the bassin was located in the parterre du Midi. So you will have found such vases, not displayed on the ground, but around the fountain. Here it's another engraving showing the very same shape. So I was very excited. I did find these vases in New York in a small auction, and they were, being belie they were believed to be made in the 1950s, but they were made in the 1650s. Uh, and it's of course, you find the dolphin handle, which in France is always a very important symbol, and painted in blue and white with Chinese figure, according to the latest fashion. So here, they are being shown, they are displayed on top of a marble circle, but on top of a trillie. So there were many, way, many ways to use these vases. So I've shown you at the very beginning how large are the gardens of Versailles, and there are many bosquets. What is a bosquet? It's a small corner with a theme. It's an enclosed garden. And here, I found these vases, and what was fascinating is to see them all everywhere on top of the trilly, and with the same idea of playing with the white, blue, white, blue. That vase, when I found it, was thought to be made in the 21st century, too. 20th century, I'm sorry. And then, when, you, when I was studying all these 
painting and engraving, I also found different sources. And what was neat is to find different type of vases. This, these were probably not made in ceramic, but maybe in tin or bronzes or painted metal. What was interesting was to copy the, to compare the shape. Medici vase on a small pedestal with um, fi figurative and all. So we've seen these vases on tapestries, uh, painting, engraving. What about the literature at the time? What did the people think about these vases? Did they see them? Yes, they did. They highly praised them. André Philippien, in 1674, in his um, book, Les Divertissements de Versailles, Entertainment of Versailles, described the display along the canal of hundreds of porcelain, in fact, faience in blue and white, hundreds of vases containing small trees. He also says that in the Bosquet du Marais, we could see orange trees patted in porcelain vases among large quantity of flowers. I quote Felibien, to the beauty of this place has been added thousands of enhancement, especially a large quantity of orange tree pots and porcelain pots filled with a multitude of flowers. This is what we see here, and this is the type of pot we will have used at that time. In a, the, the profuse display of blue and white vases was a sort of source of delight for the visitor. In a 1669 novella, La Provenade de Versailles dédiée au roi, the walk of Versailles dedicated to the king, Madeleine de Scudery visited the garden with a guest that she named the beautiful stranger. The guest presses all over the flower vases displayed along the terrace as being so beautifully arranged. And she also notices that the large number of vases were made of porcelain, <coughs> while others were made of bronze. This use for faience vases in the garden was, was not in, exclusive to the French court. French factories also produced pot for the other court of Europe. One example embodied this production is the example of the court of Sweden. Nicodem Tessin came to Paris twice. He was very close to Le Nôtre. Le Nôtre was a sort of his mentor. And he studied in Paris for three years between 1677 uh, and 1690. And he came during his second trip in 1687. And this is one of the drawings where you see he's, he's um, taking note. He shows what is a flower bed from a Jardin La Française. And what is very interesting is what he wrote here. In French, he explained everything, especially the display. Please note the way the plat bande of the lawn framing around the flower bed are display porcelain vases on top of red marble circle. So what did he do when he went to Sweden? Oh, sorry. So he, when the queen of Sweden asked him to redesign Drunkildom, to make a, a Versailles in Drunkildom, the first thing he did was to recreate the Jardin à la Française. And they had to order fire spot from Nevers. And these are very important because they bear the arms of the queen. So we can date them precisely. And the beauty of these vases is they're still at Drunkildom, in the castle where they were meant for. We even find garden urns with the coat of arm of the king, Karl XII of Sweden. So these were made a bit later. As you see, both production were made in blue and white with Chinese figure according to the latest fashion with baroque shape. So very similar to the Garcia vase that I think could have been made for the gardens of Trianon. But in Europe, it's important to remember that another factory was producing the same type, type of ware it was Delft in the Netherlands. One queen embodied the taste in Europe for flowers in China, or Delft porcelain, Delft faience, made in blue and white, is Queen Mary. So in the Netherlands, when she was princess, wife of the Prince of Orange, William III, they lived in Etlo Palace in Apeldoorn, 
where they had this beautiful Jardin La Française and a garden and a castle designed by Daniel Marot in the French manner. And when they moved to England, when she became queen, queen they moved to Hampton Court. And the first thing she did was to recreate the water gallery to have a special place for flowers and ceramic. So here I'm showing you an image from the La Salle des Bouquets at Lopalas. It's an amazing room, entirely clad of ceramic tiles, Delft tiles. This is the room where the queen spent most of her time. She was very keen into flowers, so she would be cutting the flowers and displaying the flowers in the spouted vases that you see here. And these vases are in the same Baroque taste that what we've seen before. One factory was delivering the queen is the Greek Air Factory, owned by Peter Adrian Koch. That is the same factory that was supplying the queen when she moved to England. And here it's another tree pot with very strange motif like this um, animal feet here. And it's important because he bears the royal coat of arms of the queen and the king of England for Hampton Court Palace. Today, the Dutch are in the Netherlands, the Dutch are um, renovating Hampton uh, um, Etlo, I'm sorry. And what is fascinating is they decided to make reproduction of these vases. So if you walk through the garden, you will see faience vases in the garden. Well, in England, that taste for flowers and trees and faience was not exclusive to the queen. Here it's Charlesworth, and one of the best examples is probably the set commissioned by the first Duke of Devonshire. The fourth Earl of Devonshire became Duke in 1694, and the first thing he did was to order this ensemble of, Fayon, uh, of Delft faience vases with this arm, what you see here. In Char they are still in Charlesworth, where they remain, and um, they still have the archives with the delivery from the Greek Air Factory by Peter Adrian Koch in 1694. So it shows that these faience vases were seen as being modern and accessories and um, highest achievement for ceramic technology, but also uh, luxury symbol. So you see two types of vases, the garden urn and also vases, spotted vases with a baluster shape, twisted end all, very similar to what we, we see in Nevers, and that is very unique to the Dutch, is this pagoda form or pyramidal shape, what you see here. So we've seen that it was not just for the French court um, that we were, uh, that porters were supplying a garden urn. Now we're gonna see what was probably very French is um, the festivities thrown in the garden. I told you the French Baroque garden were meant to host sumptuous party. It was a place of entertainment. We would play music, ballet, or even, or even um, Molière was playing comedy there. So here I'm showing you uh, an engraving of in fête, a party, thrown in 1674. The vases are displayed around the fountain, which is a classic display. But some of the vases have been moved around and we use them to decorate the ephemeral structure just built for the party. So they were also seen as um, great ornament. We were using this part for a function, but also for that decorative purpose. So here is another party thrown in the garden where we see the banquet. So this is where we are going to go in the banquet thrown in the garden, where the tradition comes from Italy. Throwing banquet of uh, extravagant parties came from Renaissance Italy. Here you have this banquet of the marriage of Cupid and Psyche, which is a fresco in Mantua and Palazzo del Te, where you see silverware and you see a uh, sumptuous mounted object. This one is very interesting because it's a um, credenza for banquet, uh, for celebrating a party thrown in Cardinal Chigi Garden in Rome and his palazzo in 1668, so at the same time of Versailles. And we know from the archives that all this were, were made in Italy and it was completely white. And you imagine all these hundreds of objects next to each other and the white being a great contrast with the green. 
This is here an engraving of a sort of the banquet that would have been thrown in a bosquet. So you are always at the bosquet. You, we found the same concept of Renaissance time, enclosed space for a special party. And you will have the credenza here. So white type of ceramic, the French were making at the time of the French Baroque, Le Grand Jour Versailles, the time where the king ordered the silverware, the famous mobilier d'argent, which was a sumptuous furnishing entirely made of silver that had to be melted in 1689 because the king had to raise money for the war. So we had to replace the silver by ceramic. We know from 1668 that sumptuous bodies were thrown in Versailles and they will take the silver out from the castle to display it in the garden. But later on, they made it in ceramic. So this very strange looking basin, you have the basin here flanked by two eagle head. They look quite mean. And the basin is sitting on this very strange looking feet, most likely ostrich feet. It took me forever to really understand what, what kind of animal it could have been. And it is very strange looking. Uh, very, it's, it's over the top, quite ugly, we can say. Uh, but it's very close to what the silver would have looked like, or the furniture. And it's interesting to look at an engraving by Alexis Lenoir. Alexis Loir. He was one of the king's goldsmiths, and we know he supplied the king for silver. And look this idea of having uh, this uh, chimera, chimera here, or these ugly faces. So Louis XIV's style was meant to surprise, to impress, to coat your eye. It was not meant to please your eye. Well, I guess in ceramic, it worked out pretty well. And, <laughs> and we know that they were quite close because when you look at some of these pieces, these are, I forgot to mention, these are very, very big. Huh? They are a meter high, so it's about that big. Another example, oops. Another example of the collaboration of a goldsmith, Claude Ballin, who supplied the king for silverware and also for garden bronzes, bronze vases. And you see the same dragon. So the porters were really following the latest fashion for the shape of the object. They were up to date. So I started to think what a credenza could have looked like. So I put things together, trying to put objects from all the different museums that I know or my different archives. So you see very large ewer, flask, chargers, basin, and small ewers. I was astonished when I found out that a big part of this idealistic credenza belonged to Sir Andrew Fountain. The Fountain family collected Italian maiolica, French enamels, French ware, for over four generations. It's a very famous collection for scholar and ceramic. But Sir Andrew Fountain I was a British lord who during his grand tour made his first purchase in France and Italy. And he's believed that the French faience was among his earliest purchases. So it is highly possible that he bought them because they were important work of art, but also because of their provenance. So this core of pieces, this group of pieces could be the core for what could have been a royal credenza. And in fact, it works pretty well because we know in different material that for the bosquet, special furnishing were being made. Here is the grove walk, la, la, le bosquet des rocailles. And for this bosquet, we made gilded tin furniture that you see here. These are reproduction, of course, but we know from the archives what they look like. And when you see this furnishing, it's very similar in the style of, what, of the ceramic. It's monumental, very structured, very massive, with ugly heads. <laughs> here, here, what you see here. So the repertoire for the shape, for the iconography, is very similar to 
everything that was made for the garden at that time. So we can imagine that special wear were being made for a bosquet or a special event. So then I went to look at the iconography. So most of the pieces I've shown you are depicting a bacchanal or mythological scene, festive scene. It's about a party. What about this one? Well, this one is here is a classic mythological scene. It's the rape of Europa after François Chauveau, first published in Paris in 1674. So we see that they are using the latest engraving available, which makes the object quite modern. But I was very surprised. I was, it was a puzzle to me when I found the engraving for the border. Because all these figures, so cupids riding swan, pan, and this one, <laughs> they came from this book by Blaise de Visionnaire. Les images de tableaux et de plates peintures de Philostrate. He was illustrated in Paris by Antoine Caron in Paris in 1614. Why would they use such old engraving when they had access to the latest one? Well, in fact, we know that Charles Lebrun was using this very book for his teaching at the École des Sculptures, de l'Académie de Peinture et de Sculpture. So it was a source that was available at this time and they were working from. And that is also the same source that they use for the garden, for the iconography of the sculpture. You see here the figure of Pan is very similar to this one. So they were not using something old or not fashionable anymore. They, they were very well chosen. And look, when you see these cupids riding swan, they're strikingly similar to what you will see in the fountain. So this object, were in perfect harmony with Versailles, either for the shape, for the use, or for the iconography. So I like to imagine that the Neuve Porter produced a sumptuous production of earthenware in the 17th century for the supply of this garden. So next time when you go to Versailles, please go in the gardens, get out of the castle, even if it is a rainy day, and imagine you will be surrounded by hundreds of vases. And imagine if you were the king, you will leave the castle in the morning with the display of vases around you. You will have a party in the Trianon de Porcelaine, and when you will come back, you will have a new display with the vases. And I think that, that must have been quite an achievement and quite an entertainment for the king. Thank you very much.